Porosity in metal 3D printing is usually a bad thing, but not if you can control it. We have an example of intentional porosity for filtration in this episode of The Cool Part Show. This episode was originally streamed live through the IMTS Spark platform. Enjoy. The Cool Parts Show is brought to you by Carpenter Additive. The company's Athens, Alabama Emerging Technology Center is an end-to-end -end additive manufacturing production facility with everything from material development to post-processing under one roof, ready to help you with your next metal 3D printing job. Check them out at carpenteradditive.com. Now back to the show. Hi there, I'm Pete Zielinski. I'm Stephanie Hendrickson. Welcome to the Cool Parts Show Live. This is our third special live episode through IMTS Spark. Um, if you haven't joined us live before, this is a lot like the regular show, uh, with the exception that our expert is going to be joining us here live very shortly. Stephanie, we've got this uh, bright, um, odd little disc. <laughs> yes, so this is today's cool part. Um, this is a 3D printed copper filter. So okay. it's all one piece and the filtration is built in. Filter what? Okay, so to be specific, this is an air filter. Um, this was developed by the X1 company to filter out the coronavirus. So um, X1 was actually looking into 3D printing metal filters for water prior to the pandemic and they decided to see if they could take some of the lessons they'd learned um, and apply them to create a, a metal filter um, that could be reusable to, um, for respirator systems to protect, protect against the coronavirus. Okay, so a couple pickups out of that. So um, um, the coronavirus crisis and, and innovation arising from that, like that's the nature of crises, right? That, that they lead to um, uh, changes in thinking, invention that has, has implications beyond the crisis. Um, I'm excited to hear more about that. And then X1, we know X1, um, metal 3D printing technology. They're well known for binder jet. Um, and uh, I, I have to believe that somehow um, binder jet figured into the, the filtration that this is able to achieve. Um, but a filter, right? So we usually think of a filter as like fiber or cloth or like, how can it be metal? Why metal? <laughs> yeah, so good question. So um, it, it, during the, this whole coronavirus situation, we've gotten used to um, the image of the N95 mask, like this thing, this woven thing that fits over your face. And really that mask, the entire thing is the filter. Um, and those masks work great, but the issue with them is um, they're not reusable. You can't really clean it. You can't put it into an autoclave. Like at a certain point, that mask has, has, has met its usable life and it's safest to just throw it away. And so the idea behind this filter was to develop something that would be reusable, um, something cleanable. Um, and this would be, uh, obviously this is not gonna cover your entire face. So this would be sort of a filter cartridge that you would put into a, a respirator system. Um, and the way that they get to uh, filtration is not by weaving fibers together, but by actually building porosity into the middle of this, of this disc. Okay, so you're, you're answering what felt to me like a really obvious question, which is like, how do you breathe through a, a seemingly solid piece of metal? But the answer is that it's not solid. There's, there's porosity running all through this. And, and porosity, usually, usually the lack of porosity is the bragging point of metal additive processes. We talk about how dense they are. Um, you're kind of saying that um, the, the microscopic porosity here, it's, it's good porosity. It's, it's the characteristic they were looking for. Yeah, exactly. So this is not a fully dense metal part, but that doesn't mean it's a faulty part. It's, it's, pro, it's porous by design. So this is controlled porosity. So how do you control porosity? What do you do to a binder jet process to get exactly the filtration that you want? Yeah, so that's a good question. But I think before we go there, let's just talk about binder jetting. Do you want to explain the process a little bit? Uh, I can do that. Okay, 
uh, binder jet, um, metal additive manufacturing process, uh, a powder bed process, but it's a process that maybe has the most in common with printing the way we think of it, uh, printing on paper, um, because a binding agent is laid down um, using what, what look like maybe like inkjet nozzles. Uh, a binding agent, uh, layer by layer by layer, binds together the metal powder into the shape desired, and, and it comes out of that process um, in a brittle state, a fragile state, uh, um, called a green state. It goes from there to a sintering oven where at higher temperature, uh, the metal particulate fuses and achieves the final um, uh, compactness, uh, hardness, and metal properties uh, to get a, a precise, fully realized production part. So it is metal additive manufacturing that does not involve melting. And I have a feeling like that fact, um, that there's never a liquid state, is probably key to achieving and holding the porosity we're looking for. Yeah, and so um, you asked how, how the binder jetting process is adapted to achieve this porosity, and there's a couple of different variables that you can play with. Um, so just to run through a couple, uh, it is a powder-based process, and the size of the powder particles can have an effect. If you have larger pieces of powder, they're going to leave larger pores in between them. Smaller powder, finer powder, um, you get smaller pores. The way that you handle the powder has an effect, um, so some of these systems, after they, they replenish the layer of powder before the binder drops, um, you can actually compact it. And so by either compressing it more or compressing it less, you can influence the porosity. And then there's that sintering step that you alluded to. Um, if you put this into your, your oven, your furnace, um, and maybe lower the temperature or reduce the amount of time that it spends in there, uh, you're going to end up with a less dense, more porous part. So a couple of different ways that you can tweak the, the process to get to that controlled porosity. Okay, so the result is a, is a, is a filter, and, and as you've described, there are these variables you can control with, within the binder jetting process to get you this porosity, and the result is, um, yeah, this filter that could be sterilized, reused, um, but this still looks like a solid metal part. Like, can you really breathe through this? So that's been a real challenge with this project, actually. So people, if you've been if you've been following, um, you know, the news around 3D printing and the coronavirus, you might have seen an earlier press release uh, last year from X1 with a filter that kind of looked like this, but it was more of just like a flat disc um, with lots of teeny tiny little pores in it. Um, and they found that that design worked really well. They were getting filtration that was actually exceeding the N95 standard, um, but you couldn't breathe through it. And so with this design, you have these kind of triangular holes, um, and they're basically kind of like funneling the air into the area of, of tighter porosity. Um, and so by increasing the surface area of the filter, you can get more airflow through it. You can actually breathe through this. Um, but I do want to mention that X1 also sees a case for those other kinds of filters, um, not for respirator masks, but maybe for um, air handling systems like on a bus, in a plane, in buildings, um, some situations where you would be able to mechanically force the air through the filter and you're not relying on somebody's lungs to, to move it. Okay, so I get it. I get the, the engineering challenge involved here is getting porosity that is fine enough and tight enough that it can catch a virus, but then balancing that with enough surface area so that a normal human with normal lung strength can, can draw air through this. And, and these, these triangular divots are a device for increasing the surface area. So the porosity running through this that's so fine we can't see it, is it like is it like the size of a virus? So not necessarily. A, vi a, a filter doesn't necessarily have to have pores that are smaller than the thing it's trying to filter. But what it has to do is create opportunities for those particles to get trapped. And so the pores running through this filter um, may not necessarily be smaller than the coronavirus, but they're going to force the coronavirus through all these twists and turns and these passageways that are going to make it much more likely for that particle to get stuck on a wall somewhere and not make it all the way through. So I get it. So, so, you, so we say filter, and I imagine a strainer, but that's not right, right? It's, it's not a strainer, it's a maze. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so where is this at? Is this, a, is this a real solution, ready to go? So I think now would be a great time to bring in our expert. So let me introduce you to Patrick Doherty. He is a senior R&D engineer at the X1 company. 
Patrick, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Pete and Stephanie. So we have been talking about the development, the making of this filter, and we want to know where you're at with this. Like, what's the status on this project? Yeah, so um, this has been a pretty exciting and really fast moving project from the start. As you mentioned, we had a press release last year. So, it, you know, in a way, I think when we first approached the pandemic, we kind of all thought we needed a turnkey solution right away. Um, and we pushed really hard to move quickly. But as you mentioned before, it's been a challenge. And so we've been kind of moving forward on the R&D side um, as quick as we can to start optimizing the design, getting larger airflows and working a lot with both um, you know, people at the FDA, uh, working with um, some government, some academia, and looking for partners to push this forward. And so I, I would say that right now we're still in that developmental stage, but I think we've seen that this is, this is a problem that probably isn't going away right, right now. And so we're really still trying to push this forward to get a solution that could be to market that will have, um, and as you alluded to earlier, that magic mix of enough filtration, but enough airflow at the same time. Patrick, can we talk about the material for a sec? It's, it's copper, and, and I know that in metal 3D printing in general, copper presents challenges. In laser-based processes where there's melting involved, there are some, there are some, there are some difficulties working with copper. Does copper yeah. present challenge or difficulty in binder jet? Yeah, so um, copper is a really interesting material. We've run into a couple that are like this, but whenever it packs in powder form, um, it has this strange property where the green density that we get, so as you talked about earlier, that's at that point where we're just binder and powder particles now, it's actually lower than the apparent density of the powder. And so apparent density is generally how, if you pour this powder in, for those who don't know, um, how's, it, how's it gonna pack just under its own weight? and copper has this phenomenon where it will actually be less dense than if you just poured it into a vial and let it sit. And that's very different than most of the powders that we work with, where your green density is going to be somewhere between apparent and tap because of the compaction that we add. And so normally, you know, that's a challenge that we are fighting with a lot of really unique techniques on our end that we've talked about before, like nanoparticles in the binder and things like that. But in this case, in this application, it actually helps us. So it allows us even wider control over the porosity that you would see and allows us to get to some really low density parts that still maintain strength where you can still handle them. And so that's definitely one of the, you know, one of the happy accidents involved with this project and with copper that it's such a great antiviral material, but it actually lets us to get more porosity and better porous networks. Okay, so the, you, you mentioned the antiviral properties. Let's go there a little bit. Um, this is a reusable filter, um, and, and, and conceivably that means um, you would sterilize it between uses, but are you learning anything about I don't, what, what copper makes possible? Is it possible you just leave this out overnight and just the copper alone kills the virus? Yes, so that's one of the things we like to bring to the table the most with this product, honestly, is that that reuse, but also this ease of cleaning and sterilization where there's almost like a self-cleaning procedure that goes on with viral particles. And the, the theory behind that, and there've been you know, a number of articles published about copper from New England Journal of Medicine, um, lots of studies on the news. I'm sure you've seen products that have come up, like even some of the masks that have like fiber, fiber reinforced copper in them. and those studies really all point to the fact that generally within four to six hours, you'll get up to, and maybe even more now, like a log four reduction in terms of the virus that would be touching the copper. And then it drastically pulls down that population of the virus to a, a log four reduction, you know, 99.9999%. Um, so for our cases, um, we have done, we've done some testing that we haven't gotten a chance to do anything with real viral particles yet, but we've done some testing with surrogates where we've seen um, down to a log two reduction just within an hour, which is really encouraging of 99.99% reduction. And what's unique about this is the, the, the porous nature of this product in general makes it a little hard to test um, because as you, you can imagine if I'm putting a sample on there and I wanna find out how much is left when I'm done, I have to be able to test that sample of what I put down again. And it's been challenging with this because it just soaks up so much of that sample because of the porosity. And so 
we really think that we're going to have an even enhanced effect in that regard because there's just so much surface area nested within this porosity for that virus to get trapped by and then, you know, to subsequently die. Yeah, so talk a little bit more about the, the different design iterations that you went through. So we know there were, were at least two different versions, um, but I think that's not everything that you considered. How did you end up with this design? Yeah, so that's, that's honestly a pretty cool story. Um, we started off with, as you mentioned, the press release before that people have probably seen, just a disc that was really like probably that big. It was, it was good for filtration. Um, we were getting up in the N99% range. So, you know, 99% of particles were, were, were being stopped by, by the filter, but we had to push the pressures up to get the requisite air flows beyond what would be, you know, feasible by somebody, especially if you're working on your feet all day. So um, <clears throat> we really had to up the surface area so that you can imagine what that means is that now I have more channels that I can pull air through but the idea is that those pores are going to be the same. It's still going to be a really long and twisty path from one end to the other. And so you can pull more air, but still trap just as many particles. So um, we went through some iterations on our own uh, in terms of just looking at increasing the size of, of the disk. But then we really wanted to get more clever about it. And what we did was we pulled in some of our collaborators at the University of Pittsburgh uh, for their engineering school. And they actually put a big challenge out there to a senior design team to come up with what is the most, you know, a little bit of design for binder jets. So what's the kind of design that's really gonna give us a robust handleable part and one that will survive the furnace, but also what's gonna maximize our surface area. And they, they pulled a lot from like heat exchanger design and, you know, finding out a part that would start off with kind of like big pin arrays that would stick up. So that was really our, our first big surface area change was it really just looked like it had a bunch of needles uh, sticking out of the top, but it was pretty fragile and it was hard to handle. So we moved on to another type of design and a couple of them that featured concentric bullseyes. So you can imagine if I had my circle, it was like one here, then one that would be smaller, one that would be smaller, all of these basically sitting on a disc. And each of those is, you know, a millimeter thick, basically hollow wall that you pull this, you know, sorry, porous wall that you pull the air through. And then finally it came to this one, which really pulled in the best of high surface area. You can handle it much easier and you don't have to worry about it nearly as much in the furnace in terms of distortion or slumping or any type of cracking. And they actually, um, I guess I should note that they ended up winning their, their big senior capstone engineering program at, at Pitt. So it was, it was really exciting for, for, I think, hopefully for them as well. And we were, ex we were glad that they could help us out and add some design you know, expertise in that regard. So there are applications beyond the, the respirator use that we're talking about. Um, um, right before we brought you on, Stephanie mentioned like the, the, the possibility of air handling systems, um, maybe in buildings, maybe in vehicles. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe what those applications look like and, and the, the way forward there that you see? Absolutely. So this was... Um Probably a couple months in, uh, it kind of clicked in light bulb fashion that, you know, we're, we're not getting as easy a path to the air flows that you could just put on a mask and, and breathe through easily. And we thought, you know, that's, that's obviously something we want to overcome in terms of bringing this to a filter that could be used for PPE. But, you know, there's this other avenue where what if we could use these in an inline system like an HVAC and be able to essentially combine that with your standard HEPA filter that would be used but this would be an antiviral version of that and one that would be <clears throat> hopefully self-cleaning so you wouldn't have to take it out of the system nearly as often as you might with another type of filter. And so you could imagine the implications that would have for something like transportation industry in terms of being able to use this on an airplane or a bus or subway to large buildings like convention centers. Um, one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest bites that we've gotten at this to get some early testing has been actually at Pitt's, um, Pitt's facilities for some of their labs and putting this, you know, essentially you could imagine an array similar to the filters we have now, where they might be stacked in a sheet that's very similar to the filter you'd put in your furnace at home. And you would put that, you know, in, in series with the other one. And this would be something that would, in addition to helping filter some of the other particles out as well, actually end up being an antiviral filter that would kill coronavirus particles for that. So, so that is another avenue that we're excited about because we can use the building's system to push the airflow through 
and we can leverage a much bigger surface area that you couldn't wear on your face or it would be pulling your head down all day. So there's there's a lot of benefits there for us and it's a much much more near term um, application we, we believe than, than necessarily having to push the whole way to PPE. All right, I think I've got this. All right, take it away. <laughs> all right, uh, this is a filter enabled by 3D printing. Um, filter, we usually think of it as made of cloth, made of fiber. This is a reusable metal filter enabled by binder jetting, made of copper, antiviral metal. Um, and using uh, binder jets uh, solid state 3D printing capabilities to control the porosity all the way through the process. Oftentimes with metal parts, porosity isn't what you want. You want um, as near to, to complete density as you can get. But in this case, porosity is an engineering advantage getting just the right pore sizes to enable this to filter out uh, coronavirus. The initial application was for respirators. The idea being um, get enough surface area that, that for airflow to allow uh, a human being, human lungs, to draw air through, um, to, through the porosity that is catching the virus. Um, but other applications that they've uh, found as they imagine the possibilities for this reusable filter are um, industrial, in vehicles, um, in systems where pressure is driving the air through. Uh, this is, it looks like a solid metal part. It is not. There is microscopic porosity all through here. Um, intricate, complex winding paths all through this seemingly solid metal that, that capture the virus as it goes through. And, and um, studies are suggesting, studies are being prepared to validate the question of whether the antiviral properties of copper might be just enough to let the virus die and maybe no interim sterilizing step would even be needed. Yeah, so the great recap, I think we should bring Patrick back and, and take some audience questions. All right. Excellent. Sure. 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 Here, here comes one. Um, it's a little bit long. I'm just going to read it. Uh, we've talked a little about how the fineness of the powder affects the porosity, but I understand X1 has been looking at adding nanoparticles and material into the binder itself. You, um, alluding to what you mentioned earlier, Patrick, can you tell us more about nanoparticles? Sure. So um, we've we've held some patents on uh, nanoparticulates and including them into the binders for many years now. Honestly, since some of the early technology that we put forth. Um, We've started to make more advancements in that in that sector, and one of the things that um, I actually gave a, a webinar that we presented on nanofuse, as we're calling it, basically, which is our, our version of the X1 binder that has, you know, a functionality in it in terms of working with a nanoparticle system that will be tailored for that specific material. And so, in the case of copper, um, what we've looked at and presented there was we were actually able to increase density over non-particulate, um, let's say, nanofuse-assisted copper um, by up to 4%. And for us, in terms of what we presented there, that was the difference between like 90% and 94% for, for copper, um, or 92% to 96%, uh, I think, for our, our best case. And that was really exciting because as far as we know, that's as far as people have gotten with binder jet copper. Um, for other scenarios, though, the nanoparticles have lots of different functional additives. So it could be something that enhances a, a, a can enhance um, from a centering aid perspective. So if you have a difficult to densify material, that's known to have sintering aids that will help the particles diffuse together, you can use the nanoparticles so that you don't have to worry about mixing it into a powder where you just have to essentially cross your fingers that the, the particles remain right where you need them and they get lodged in the interstitial sites between particles, but you can just deliver them right there so that they are literally put on by the binder to the particles where you need them. And so that's some of the most exciting aspects of that. And I guess for, for this project too, there's even the fact that these nanoparticles do have a tendency to increase surface area, so this is relatively new in terms of the filter project, but there's a good chance that it'll creep in here as well and we'll start using it when it comes to these porous metal filters. Uh, one other question came in, Patrick, and it's really simple, and I love this because as, as we as we think about uh, production for a product like this, um, we have to face this. How do you inspect these filters? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the things we've looked at so far has been CT. So um, uh, one of the challenges with that is the size of the part. And so one of the things we've been trying to do the best with is make very similar to you do in other techniques. We'll do like a witness coupon or something that we'll include in the build 
that we'll be able to use like a micro CT on to actually examine what's the porosity like, um, what does it look like in terms of the connectivity. So you can imagine, you can actually track, it's really cool, you can track the, the torturosity, so to speak, of these paths as they wind through. And um, when it comes to looking at these down the road, um, we're trying to figure out a couple non-destructive techniques that would be very similar to that, but capable of picking up some of the organic matter. Because for us, that's one of the big open questions in terms of, you know, how often we would need a hard answer, right? Of how often do we have to clean these? And one thing you can do is just track the airflow that you're pulling, right? Or you can start to tell because the particles on the inside should be dead, even through autoclaving, but you want to be able to see, you know, how, at what point do I have to clean it just by removing all, all the organic particles? So um, doing airflow tests, um, even doing weight mass loss change type of experiments is something we can do now, but that's one aspect we'd like to improve upon in terms of really being able to see inside there, not just look at the pores, but what's in the pores. All right, that's our questions, and, and my word for the day is tortuosity. Tortuosity. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Patrick. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Patrick, and thank you, all of you who are, who are tuning in live. Thanks for watching us. To see more episodes of the show, thecoolpartsshow.com. If you have a cool part that you'd like to tell us about, you can email us at coolparts at additivemanufacturing.media. Thanks for watching. Thank you to our sponsor, Carpenter Additive. Listen to Additive Manufacturing podcasts, attend webinars, and learn more at carpenteradditive.com. <laughs>